when we say access to justice, it's not some lofty, you know, thing about your First Amendment rights necessarily. It's just getting decent legal service and de decent legal advice in your everyday mundane, you know, life in a way that ultimately could improve your life or avoid your life from going down the, you know, in a tailspin. I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. This episode of Daily Matters is brought to you by the 2020 Clio Cloud Conference, the world's best legal conference, which is going completely virtual for the first time in eight years. Get your pass now at cliocloudconference.com. Today, we're joined by Lucy Rika and John Lund of the Utah Implementation Task Force on Regulatory Reform, aiming to increase access to and affordability of legal services while protecting consumers. Lucy and John, thanks so much for being here today. Happy to be here. Our pleasure. Really looking forward to this discussion, Lucy and John. Starting off, I'd love it if each of you could take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves and explain your role in the Utah Implementation Task Force on Regulatory Reform. Uh, and Lucy, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, I guess the first thing I should note is that um, the task force itself is, is pretty much wound down at this point um, because I think it was two or three weeks ago we received approval um, to actually launch the official Sandbox and the new regulator. So um, we are now the Office of Innovate, Office of Legal Services Innovation, um, uh, an office in the State Supreme Court of Utah. So just up front, um, we we can. It's all of a piece, um, and 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 uh, you know, developing as it goes along. But um, yeah, it's, that's exciting and and a and a sort of significant inflection point for us. But uh, my background, um, I'm a lawyer regular, you know, went to UVA for law school, um, practiced at Oric um, in the beginning of my career in securities lit and white collar, um, clerked uh, in the federal court. And then um, I was at Stanford for um, about, I think it's five years as the executive director of the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession. And that was where I really got immersed in issues related to the profession um, as an entity and things like the access to justice and diversity regulation, ethics, rules, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I became involved with the task force um, after I left that role for a family move down to Los Angeles. Um, and I was looped in through Jillian Hadfield and Margaret Hagen um, to join a meeting in February of 2019 um, in Salt Lake City where um, the task force sort of came together around this proposal of the sandbox and risk-based regulation. Yeah, Jack, Lucy was, Lucy was one of our first recruits to the, uh, to the effort out here in Utah and, and most important, one of the most important recruits. Um, my, my role in this project uh, currently uh, is to be now chair of the innovation office of the Supreme Court. Um, and Lucy is our executive director. So you're, you're speaking to the two folks that I guess hold the ball at this point in terms of moving things forward. Uh, I've been involved in one version or other of these task forces for a couple of years now, including the one Lucy alluded to that really wrote the recommendations to the court to implement the sandbox. Those, as you know, were uh, submitted to the court last August, uh, and it took about a year after those were submitted to get our rule changes and, and our concepts and so forth all together. Uh, and that's what we've been working on since I'm a I'm a former president of the Utah State Bar. Um, I'm a trial attorney. Uh, I work with a firm in Parsons Bailey and Latimer in Utah and around the West. So I'm a I'm not a ORIC guy, but I'm a big firm guy by Utah standards. Um, and um, and you know I've seen iterations of attempts by the bar and by the courts to to uh, find a project, you know, that helps access to justice. And they're, they're big lifts usually for, for the court and for the bar. They spend tens of thousands of dollars, they come up with a website. I'm not diminishing that in the least, but that's kind of my frame, frame of mind is 
this opportunity to have the innovation come and be driven by the market and by the opportunists out there that want to see how they can make something work just opens up a whole new level of, of opportunity for us to provide legal services. And, and John, maybe you can give a, a little bit more context just on the, the task force, the, the work it produced, what was submitted to the Supreme Court and, and where it's landed us now with this, this most recent uh, ruling. Can you walk us through what that process looked like? And it was indeed a, a big lift, but tell us a bit more about that story. Sure. I mean, the, the, the inspirational route to this all comes from a speak a talk that uh, Jillian Hadfield and just to less extent Margaret Hagan gave to a court of con conference of court chief justices up in Vancouver, Washington in the spring, I think, of 2018. And, and Justice Simonis and I were there. Chief Justice Durant was there. We listened to um, them speak about how reimagining regulation around legal services could really impact access to justice and we sat down at our table and the, the chief said I, I said well lawyers are anxious about this you know this makes us lawyers nervous we have a set of rules you you can't expect us to go try new and different things without you know having it be safe well what do you need he asked well what do you need to have happen i i, I said i think we we need to look at seriously relaxing the rules that led to the bar requesting the court to form this task force which that's when Dino Hamonas came in and recruited some wonderful members, including Lucy and, and Jillian and Tom Clark and others that we've now worked together with for a couple of years. And, and over the course of a, of a year, we wrote up the recommendations to the court. Um, that's a pretty beefy, what is it, Lucy, 60 pages or something? It's long. It's long. And, but it's research. We looked at the UK. We looked at all these sort of dynamics and came to the recommendations that we did, which included this fundamental idea that we needed to relax the rules around the business of law, but have a sandbox where those things taking advantage of the relaxed rules could be tested and could be tried in a way that was overseen and hopefully safe. That, those are the two main components to that. The court last August, August of 2019, approved that report and adopted the recommendations and told us to implement them. And so, the same basic task force continued forward at that point with implementation of those recommendations. We designed the sandbox idea. Lucy's been very instrumental in that. We, we wrote regulatory principles up around that idea. Um, and then also our rules committee, our court rules committee was working on revisions to the rules that needed to follow. Those, those revisions to the rules came out, I think it was March, maybe February of this year for an extended public comment period, twice as long as normal, a 90 day period, during which we heard from lots of folks about, about those rule changes and court reacted to that. Our bar studied those rule changes, lots of conversation over the last 90 days uh, here in Utah around whether the court should uh, implement the rule changes and adopt the sandbox or not. Um, with tweaks and adjustments, related to that public comment that they did in fact enter that order. I think it was last week, wasn't it Lucy, that they officially entered the order? Yes. I yes. So. <laughs> so they entered the order that established the office. Um, it also affected the rule changes and, and we're so to speak open for business. Yeah. And I would just, go ahead, uh, Jack, if I could just jump in, I want to just go back a sec to, um, mm -hmm to sort of the beginning or the middle of the beginning. Um, and I wanna just note that uh, from the get-go, the ability to drive this model forward was really supported by the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, IELTS of the University of Denver Law School, and the National Center for State Courts. Um, both of those entities were, uh, IELTS in particular, in terms of um, uh, helping to, with, through paying me essentially to work on building up the model um, and uh, NCSC by supporting Dr. Tom Clark's uh, work in this area. So um, I just want to make sure that we recognize the, the support of the, both of those institutions. Excellent. Thank you. And, and it sounds like we're entering a, a brave new world as of la last week. These new rules are in force. 
the the sandbox is set up for for people to 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 play in. Um, Lucy, can you tell us more about what what comes next and maybe what what we've seen percolating on the the horizon as as what might be some of the more immediate impacts and and what what do you see as as, as the progression from here on in looking like? Sure. Um... So, you know, it's funny. I think, uh, I think John, I said this to you the other day, it, we're really, this is like launching a startup. Um, it's, it's, you know, intense work, um, a lot of hard thinking, um, both legal hard thinking and then sort of like, you know, project slash structural hard thinking. Um, so it's been really exciting and, um, and a lot of fun. Uh, part of, um, so right now, you know, we are almost ready to officially launch. I mean, we have, uh, we're just getting kind of the last technical pieces. By that, I mean actual case management platform <laughs> um, up and going. But we, because the court has been so supportive in letting, um, in, in like progressive, pro thinking progressively about um, how can we uh, move this forward, uh, the court back in the spring said that even though the, the, you know, the rules were put out for the rules in the standing order were put out for public comment. So we, we didn't have official approval, but the court said, go ahead and start bringing in uh, applications. Um, at the time, it was sort of of a mind, well, maybe we can approve some if that are specifically COVID related um, that, that could start providing relief to folks immediately. But then we realized that logistically it would be a little complicated and the time frame was so short anyway. Let's just try and line it all up. But the the impact was we were able to start getting applications in and start working out the kinks of that process The you know, uh, intake, assessment, review, recommendation, like all of that process stuff that we, which also had a lot of substance built in because this model is really different from how lawyers are regulated. It is a risk based model that doesn't have is not so much about high bars at the front end like the lawyer model is it's it's the bars at the front end are relatively low but do require us to assess the proposed model entity model and um and identify how risky we we think that it is and then put you know requirements on the model based on that so that that's this has never been done in, in um, the American context. It's similar to what the SRA does, um, but but anyway, so it gave us the chance to actually apply what we had written out and given a lot of thought to in, in theory and in principle, but the application is quite different and much more messy um, in a good way. Um, so, so we've been able to do that. Um, we have, I think at this count, we have 18 applicants in the door. Right. Um, and, uh, and so we are just kind of working through that process now um, at the same time as we're working through the transition from the task force to the innovation office. So we hope to have um, uh, the first approvals, you know, up and out the door uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we'll just keep, it's a rolling basis right now. Once we, if the volume shoots up significantly, we may have to slow down the rolling, but, um, <laughs> but for right now it's a rolling basis. And, um, the interest has been really good. So, sorry, in terms of impact, um, I think we have some models in the door that are that have the potential to be to be highly impactful. Of course, like I, I just want to caveat that with, you know, um, I think it's Becky Sanderfer, who is uh, pretty much the world's expert on access to justice, um, an extraordinary um, social scientist who's now at the uh, Arizona State University. Um, you know, Becky always says these rule changes are necessary but not sufficient to solve this access problem. So I think I, I want to stress that because, you know, um, I think they're hugely necessary, but we're going to see a little bit more about where the gaps continue to be and how effective certain models are at helping people who are completely outside the system now. Um, that said, I do think that uh, that the models that we're that we're starting to see and and the the talk that's happening in the legal tech world, um, in the paraprofessional world, um, it is exciting and 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 it's really people thinking about um, optimizing legal services across a variety of providers and a variety of service models, and that's the kind of diversity that we need to see, the kind of competition that we need to see in the market to really benefit 
Utah consumers. So I'm excited. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the applications you're, you're seeing to this point in terms of maybe what, what aspects of the new rules are being most directly leveraged for these, these new business models? Is, it, is there anything in particular that you see as a, a common thread across those applications? Well, uh, I, I would say we have quite a wide spectrum. I mean, there are things as simple as a consumer bankruptcy guy who wants to share some equity with his paralegal in order to broaden her, you know, her involvement and her investment. In it. And, and, and that's, you know, as odd as it seems until you change these rules, that wouldn't have been allowed. Right. So, so right. that's probably a real simple example, uh, which maybe would be adapted by or adopted by a lot of people, but there's, but there's, we're finding a, a fairly consistent set of what we're calling service models. So, one, one would be a lawyer as an employee. Um, another would be some level of non-lawyer investment. And we sort of stratified that as, uh, in terms of risk, as if, if the lawyer investment is less than 50% of the total investment and the lawyers still have 50%, then we, we kind of characterize that differently. If it becomes wholly non-lawyer owned, I mean, we're still using the logic that the lawyer's investment and control is part of the, the safety factor for it. But investment, the involvement of software, how much somebody is utilizing software, and that becomes, that's an area where we really had to drill in because some people say, oh, we're gonna use software, it's gonna give the legal advice. Others say, we're gonna use software, uh, but it's gonna be overseen by lawyers and there's gonna be lawyer involvement. And then the next thing would be, well, we're using software, but um, if there's a red flag, sort of a dynamic to the, to the software and, and there needs to be better guidance to the person on the subject, then it's a non-lawyer who's trained around that particular issue, you know, who gives that guidance at the first instance. And then the lawyer is sort of, you know, up there, you know, if needed, so to speak. So it's really combinations of those things, Jack, around everything from how to fill out a financial disclosure for a divorce case to expungements and how that should work uh, to estate planning, you know? So uh, those, 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 that's a flavor, I guess, of what's already in the queue. Yeah. And, and I, Jack, I'll just say too, I think one of the areas that we're most excited about, oh, sorry, two things. First, and I think um, John hit on this, but a lot of the, the applicants that we're seeing so far are lawyer driven. Um, so it's lawyers who are thinking, okay, how can I, how can I, how can I find more people and offer more services to more people? Um, so that's exciting uh, and thinking about different, you know, what sort of money should I take on? What sort of software platform can I build um, to, to expand, you know, the services that I offer? Um, the other thing is that uh, one of the things I think we're really excited about is seeing models, and there are some in, in here already, where they're using this to engage with frontline service providers. Um, to whether it's sort of referral type relationships or actual like joint ventures with frontline service providers to folks. So you could think about it as um, whether it's like, you know, financial advisors or if it's social workers um, who are already offering people help in terms of the types of needs that we know are so acute in the access area. Um, that to us is very exciting. Um, and seeing more of those partnerships, I think, um, will help, uh, will help reach our goals. So it's, it sounds like there's a, a heavy technology component to what you're, you're seeing technology being woven in, in some way to help create scale, uh, for the way we'll be able to provide legal services. And, and non-lawyers getting into the mix a little bit more strongly as well. Are you seeing that come through as, as something thematic in the initial sandbox applications you're seeing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, again, at different, at different levels, it, it takes a couple of different pieces. Um, the, the, but generally speaking, it's around you know, we have this idea that there's form preparation and that and supply and forms are just going to be filled out. We've, we've said for a long time, that isn't really practicing law until you sort of start guiding somebody about what to say on the form. Right. Um, but, but 
an example is this, this uh, one I've mentioned about the financial disclosures and divorce cases. Okay, so that sounds a little bit like a turbo taxi thing where, you know, you just, you, you, you make a better in, uh, interface for the user for the form that's already probably posted on the court's website, uh, you know, that is a fill in the blank type form about their financial situation, which sounds minimal, but is often a major hiccup in getting a divorce to successfully, you know, move through the courts is to properly fill that form out. Well, it, the question is what, you know, the question comes up when somebody's filling out that form, should I say this or should I say that about, you know, my, my, my interest in the family cabin or whatever it is that, you know, is sort of this unusual asset. And that's when a non-lawyer would step in, right. And be the, the source for that information, that type of guidance on that particular issue. I don't know, Lucy, is that, how else are you seeing, do you think we're seeing non-lawyers fit into the picture? Well, there's, there is, uh, some of the proposals are, are proposing bringing on venture capital. Um, not as many as, as you would think. I, I mean, I, I live in Silicon Valley, so <laughs> everybody talks about venture capital. It seems impossible to start a company without one, but, um, but a couple of them have that. But um, uh, the, other, the other are these kind of service partnerships that we're talking about or multidisciplinary shops, um, which makes total sense you know um and and the caveat for all of this is you know what the standing order and the rules make clear is that lawyers participating in the in these entities as lawyers you know practicing law whether they're an employee of a non-lawyer owned entity or um partnering with a non-lawyer owned entity they are still responsible for maintaining their their ethical duties under the rules right um so they still they need to ensure that whatever the business model does or or says they are able to uh, maintain their loyalty to their client their independence and professional judgment the confidentiality of their client attorney client privilege is applicable that's on the lawyers um and so that's quite clear in a lot of these models and so i think it's going to be interesting to see how as we get more non-lawyer service models um through the door it's gonna be really interesting to see how people propose incorporating lawyers and then incorporating other sort of services that may not need or have those types of protections and the way that we're addressing it in terms of risk is obviously collecting data about it um, you know data to try and draw out whether consumer consumer harm is happening we're also requiring um disclosures so you know the firms have to say this is a non-lawyer owned entity um there may be you know differences in s some of the protections that you might receive and if you have any questions here's how you ask questions and if you have a complaint or a concern here here's the line for the um, innovation office and then for tech provision uh the disclosures along the lines of this is not a lawyer you there are certain protections that come with a lawyer they may not be applicable here such as you know but like we're trying really to have it be in plain language as possible um so that's how we're approaching it right now it sounds like what you're doing from a responsibility perspective for the lawyers is, is just rather than trying to really define the box they can operate in at the regulatory level saying, we're going to give you some latitude and you're going to be able to experiment, but your responsibilities have not changed. You, you make the contextual decisions around how you develop and deploy your services in a way that you can still meet the bar that we, we have for legal service delivery but you're allowing for a lot more freedom in the, in the, the sandbox for what that looks like. Yeah, Jack, that's exactly right. I love how you said that because um, that's sort of like an underlying ethos for this entire model um, is that, and we've, it's, been a, it's been a discipline, I think, especially for John and I, um, as opposed to the non-lawyers in our group, you know, of, uh, lawyers are so good at identifying risks and building all these rules around risks that have no actual evidence in reality. Right. And so this model is really, really trying to be uh, intentional and disciplined about not doing that. So the lawyers is one example. John, one of the things you commented on at the beginning of the discussion was uh, when this topic gets talked about, it creates a lot of angst for lawyers and, and in some cases, some very strong resistance. Uh, can you talk about what this has looked like on the ground in Utah as well? And, and I'm sure you're seeing a spectrum of reactions, but give us, uh, give us some feedback on what that's looked like. 
Yeah, it's been it's been interesting that way. I mean, I think on the one hand, we've we've um, we really tried to work with the bar uh, and and the bar's leadership. Uh, they formed their own review committee to look at the materials and sort of give a a, di a, a disciplined response. B because at some level, I don't think anybody disagrees that we have an access to justice gap and that something needs to happen and that just figuring more people should do more pro bono or that the government's going to start paying for lawyers those things just don't seem to be you know realistic solutions and and it, it just continues to grow so i don't think lawyers disagree with that and utah lawyers endorse have, have thoroughly endorsed this idea that we we believe there needs to be something done to broaden the the accessibility of legal services of course they are concerned for the impact on their livelihood, uh, which is a totally reasonable concern. Um, I think that's come from some, a couple of fairly specific quarters, uh, certainly smaller, smaller firm practitioners, which I think is a lot of Clio's, Clio's business model, um, and also um, rural, rural lawyers, but also uh, estate planners, some people that kind of maybe are already into some of the areas that, that might be most affected. Uh, and then the last one uh, would be, it's an interesting piece, but the, 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 the plaintiff's attorneys are, are concerned. So the way that's played out is we had, we had, I'd say roughly two thirds of the comments being posted in the public comment were, were negative, but none of them really complained about the sandbox. They complained really more about the, the potential risks to the profession as a whole from the changes in general. And then the other sort of limit on, on those comments is there really wasn't much data backing up the concern. Well, you know, this is going to undercut the independence of lawyers. Well, okay, we know that you are concerned about that, but do we have any way to find that out? And isn't, wouldn't it be okay to at least test that, you know, in the sandbox and see if it, it, it affects? So I think that presence of the sandbox has really actually been comforting to the lawyers. Um, at one point, Arizona, I'm not sure if they're still doing this, but they were going to simply allow ABSs and not, not put them into a sandbox and sort of just see what happened. So I, in that respect, I think this model has been, been better received. Um, I, I don't know. I, people wonder if there's something in the water here in Utah in terms of being able to move these things forward. And, and I, I'm not sure if there's anything in the water, but I think we do have a, we're right size for this. We have, you know, kind of things set up in a, in a way structurally that, that probably made it more realistic to to move this forward in Utah versus versus say in California. Yeah, maybe speak about that for a moment is, is something I, I wondered about when I saw this news coming out of Utah. What, you know, that it's a little bit surprising. This is a so, number one something that's happening in Utah. Number two that it happened so fast, at least in in you know the, the geological time scale. We usually see this kind of stuff needing to take and the. Uh, in anything in, in legal. Um, and I, I think that's number one, a, a huge compliment to everyone involved in driving this forward. But you described the, the timeline that this, uh, this went through earlier in the podcast and that that is uh, by, by any standard, uh, a pretty rapid timeline to see this kind of adoption. Can you, can you talk about what, what kind of clicked in Utah to make all of this happen so, so quickly and, and not without friction, but it feels like you found a way to navigate that friction and to, to compartmentalize the experiment in a way that we can, as you pointed out, get some data so we can make some longer term decisions around this. Well, I saw Lucy smiling. I think she probably has an answer to that. Um, I'll give you the sort of the medium peppy answer, which is I, I think we have a very good judiciary in Utah, uh, which is, of course, charged with regulation and practice of law. They are not elected judges. They are appointed judges. It, has, it is a well-run, cohesive group. And, and even among our five members of the Supreme Court, there is a good high level of collegiality such that these kind of things can become, you know, can talked about in a, in a really safe and open way. And, and it gives people, I think in the end, the courage to, to move things forward. And I, I think the next piece is um, just this compelling case for access to justice. I think that really, really is at the heart of what's moving the court. and. Um, and the, our chief, I, I think, believe, Chief Justice Durant believes that when we say access to justice, it's not some lofty, you know, thing about your First Amendment rights necessarily. It's just getting decent legal service and de decent legal advice in your everyday mundane 
you know, life in a way that ultimately could improve your life or avoid your life from going down the, you know, in a tailspin. So, right. I, I, I don't know. I, Lucy, is it personalities? <laughs> I think that I've thought a lot about this because, um, I'm in California, you know, um, and California has had a very different experience. Um, I, I do, I think John's right though. I think the, the main, the most impactful variable is the leadership of the court here. I mean, and John obviously, but, but I think, um, the leadership that the court has shown in the face of some really, um, you know, uh, difficult politics um, has has politics that like, you know, have killed reform for a hundred years. <laughs> um, so uh, the leadership of the court is really extraordinary, and the ownership of the court. You know, I think um, the the situation in California is is really different. Um, the the task force in California came out of the bar. Um, the bar, even though you know it's split in California now between regulation and advocacy, it's still it's still made up of members of, you know, the profession. And that's, if that's the starting point, it, it's really, it can be really, really difficult. Um, I do think that Utah's small size makes a difference too. And, and it's very pro, I, I don't know, John, but I think what is a very pro business and sort of, you know, um, uh, hustle sort of attitude, which I really, I, I, I get the question all the time, like, what, what, why Utah? <laughs> I'm like, I, it tickles me. I love it. Um, uh we're the the state is you know these these reforms are so far ahead of where all of the other states are um you know task forces have been formed in florida and north carolina and michigan maybe and connecticut and chicago and um i think the vision was a very very focused on entity regulation and um and adjustments to the non-lawyer ownership restrictions and the and the non-lawyer practice restrictions laser focused on that wasn't worrying about paraprofessionals that had already been done you know wasn't worrying about sort of other aspects you know uh increased pro bono requirements or stuff like that and and so that probably made a difference as well well i would say you know we pay attention to pace we pay attention to momentum we we've we've worked you know strategically to to keep things um moving ahead and anticipating you know where is this next piece going to be i i i yeah, I think it's easy to get weighed down by the bureaucracy of, of, of these things sometimes. And, and that even goes back to the, the team. I, I mean, we, you know, we did not put together a 25 member commission, you know, we, we kind of focused on people that were really going to get in and roll their sleeves up and, and, and heave ho. And that, that I think makes a difference. There were no subcommittees. <laughs> of the task force I think no I'm serious I think that's huge <laughs> because yep. all like every other task force has like 14 different subcommittees and then it's it's super hard to get anything done as Dr. Tom Clark on our team always tells us any 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 task force that's bigger than nine people is mostly performative I think that you're right I, I think that's where a lot of these task forces have fallen down in the past and I think to the extent you're you're sharing out what's worked here it's enormously useful for uh, the other groups that might be thinking about how do we how do we crack this nut because there is I think uh, what I'm hearing you know relatively small team size with a cohesive vision uh, you're not getting locked down in diffusion of responsibility through a huge set of subcommittees or an organization that's too too large and you it, it sounds like you had a real clarity of vision of where you wanted to get to and what that journey would would look like is, is there anything else in the formula for for what worked uh, with this group in, in Utah that, that you'd like to, to share out to anyone that's trying to figure out how to make this work in their state? Yeah, I would say um, non-lawyer participation, particularly by, <laughs> uh, I mean, we were lucky. We had um, two crack economists in Jillian Hadfield and Tom Clark, and economists have a real way, economists are not going to accept any assumptions around things like the market and risks um, that lawyers may throw out there. And so having Jillian and Tom constantly pushing back on our assumptions about how things should be, like we tried to take that should out of it altogether. And um, I don't know, my brain's different than it was two years ago. <laughs> so, um, and then the other thing was, was we had Becky Sandifer, who, who really, pe lawyers love to throw out 
you know, again, assumptions and kind of anecdotes about access to justice. And Becky, Becky's done all the research. So, um, and she, she can just, you know, in her quiet, calm way, will just come forward and say, no, actually, here's what the studies say. Um, here's what we know about this, and here's what we know about that, and here's why we're doing this. And it, that was incredibly helpful both inside the task force and I think in speaking to the members of the bar and the public. Well, and I'd agree that, that we were lucky in that regard, but I think it's a little bit more than that. And we've talked specifically about there being first, first mover advantages here. I mean, this is a massive industry, you know, and these are significant changes that are being driven as much by the market as they are some, you know, some set of people interested in making change. So we're really, to some extent, reacting to the way that the, the regulation is gonna happen. I mean, I, I say to lawyers, you don't, you don't wanna have the thing happen that happened with scooters on the sidewalks to law where people just stop pl start plopping down, you know, right. apps and not, not paying attention. So, you know, that's, that's been a real advantage to be first movers. And I, I just, I, I mean, at this point, I wish there were um, more we could figure out about how to help others m move along. I, I think at this point, Jack, it's really just trying to set a good example. Um, these are applicants, our participants in the sandbox. You know, I think lawyers, just like lots of other folks, they love to follow suit. And if, if they see people kind of trying something new and doing a different idea, well, that's what entrepreneurialism is all about. Somebody will come along and try to do it a little better than the first guy. So I think that's where, when I talk about momentum, that's what, what I'm thinking about is there's, there's the potential here for it to really grow on itself uh, as more gets out. Can you talk a little bit about the motivation behind what underlies all of this is access to justice as, as you've pointed out uh, uh, over the course of our, our conversation and, and obviously a lot of this got in flight pre-COVID-19 but the, the backdrop and maybe the urgency around the access to justice problem has only been amplified by COVID-19. Can, can you talk and maybe I'll ask you to start Lucy just what you see as the uh, Pre-COVID nineteen access to justice gap and and how you think that's changed amidst COVID nineteen and, and maybe in particular how you're seeing some of these uh, early applications uh, to the sandbox target or orbit around some of the specific challenges we're going to be facing uh, providing legal services in a in a COVID nineteen world both from a actual service delivery perspective as well as against the uh, the reality that that there's more economic hardship out there than there there's ever been before as well. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, this the the access to justice issue obviously predated the pandemic and the economic disruption that we're all experiencing. But um, but it the all those things have certainly amplified and and accelerated. Um, I mean, the easiest example would be what we see to be looming really soon is that is the number of evictions. Um, you know, these issues around housing, people who we know how many people have lost their jobs um, with the closure of the economy. And, um, and we know that, you know, those protections on rent and, and housing are running out. Um, so that is one specific area. The other one, though, I think that is really resonant in Utah, the eviction ones, highly resonant in Utah, but I know the access, to, and I don't have it in front of me, so I don't have the numbers, but um, the Utah Bar Foundation, right, John? Um, Utah did, Foundation, yeah. Yeah, did a, um, a great uh, justice gap study that before the pandemic, but, but the problems are the same, and it's the same ones that are going to be exacerbated, and it, and it was really focused on consumer debt as one of the biggest access issues in Utah. Um, and we know that that's another area that's just going to explode. It's where, you know, most people have no representation. We know that representation in some form, some ability to act like, I think one of the biggest problems with consumer debt issues are just defaults, right? People don't show up. Um, so, so I think that's an area that we know that um, the court and the Bar Foundation want to really focus on. And it's also an area that services that are provided that you don't necessarily need a lawyer to help people solve these problems. Um, and so, or a lawyer with, or a lawyer is like 
at the top of the tree, but there's a lot of solutions that could be available underneath the lawyer. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, we have, I hope we see more specifically on the housing stuff. Um, but we do have uh, several models in the sandbox that will that are um, focused on these subject matter areas. And so um, we want to get them launched as quickly as possible so they can get ahead uh, as much as possible with these issues. The other major, um, it's funny because, you know, we're all remote now. Um, but Utah's always been a real rural place, you know, much of the state is is very rural and people are living very far apart without access. John, I can't remember which the county, there's a county that has like one lawyer maybe, is that, I think that's right. Um, Daggett. So, Daggett County, that's right, yeah. Daggett. Daggett County, yeah. So, um, so the use of technology or remote service is gonna be hugely impactful in Utah, both before and after the pandemic, um, I think. And that's true, that's true in, in many states, you know? I mean, California has huge issues with rural populations as well. Um, so, so I think that um, the ability to allow more experimentation across these platforms will be, will be really significant. The piece of that that I, I think we're really, I'm not sure we are gonna be soon enough to help COVID-19 specifically, you know, impacted people, but a piece of this that, you know, Jack, your company's model, I think just kind of is an example of this. I'm not sure we know where things, what things could be until we see where things could go. And right. the example that I, that I think about in regards to housing is, you know, I know that if you get a form lease from a tenant or a landlord when you're first signing up for an apartment, you're unlikely to be able to negotiate different terms to that. But if somebody could do a deal with a Zillow or an apartmentfinder.com to, to add a supplemental service to allow the tenant to get plain English explanations of this lease that they're entering at the outset and get to where they knew their what their consequences were of A or B, and maybe even automate something around their timeliness of their payments and what to do, you know, you might get ahead of somebody's eviction problem before they're ever down on the eviction court. And 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 I I hope that that's the kind of thing this makes room for. I but nobody has that particular model, you know, ready to launch. Uh, but I, to me, that's when we that's when we would really start to see this concept of access to justice driving just a better better uh, living for for the citizens. Can, can you talk a little bit more uh, about how the practicalities of the, the, the sandbox will work for people that are interested in experimenting in it? What, what are the, the kind of rules and, and regs and what, what do you need to anticipate as potential outcomes in engaging with the, the sandbox? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, the, this is really where Lucy and, and our other colleagues have done a lot of the work, but I'll, I'll give you the nuts and bolts. You can make an application at sandbox.utcourts.gov and you can fill out the eight or nine questions that, that really frame up what we need in the way of an application and you can submit it. Our process thus far has been, I, I guess, iterative with applicants. Uh, we've tried to collaborate, make sure we're understanding what their model is. We've had, we've had some of them come in and actually speak to our group uh, as part of assessing their proposal. And, um, and then, and I'll let Lucy talk about what the kind of the risk, the risk analyze, an analysis involves. But once we've gone through that risk analysis, then we write a recommendation to the court. Uh, we recommend that XYZ company be authorized for the following two years to do this service subject to these conditions uh, as spelled out. And by the way, a lot of those conditions and standard, to extend as becoming standardized, have been, have been put together in what's called the Innovation Office Manual. Lucy Rica is the primary author of that. That document, I think, is almost constitutional about how people should regulate legal services on a going forward basis. Uh, and that's what we're using. And that's what, if somebody is given permission to operate in the sandbox, they'll be operating subject to the kind of the terms in, in there about data and you know reporting and, and all of that. But if it's okay, I think Lucy is much ab more able to describe kind of 
what those criteria are, what the what risks are we looking at when somebody makes an application? Yeah, I would love to hear more about that, Lucy. Sure. So it's Jack, it's like um, you know, we talked about before, we're not trying to set up a bunch of rules. Like we've really tried hard not to. And I don't disbarred lawyers cannot have more than 10% interest in any entity. Disbarred or suspended lawyers. That's one of the only hard and fast rules, I think. Um, well, and obviously, you know, lawyers participating with these entities have to uphold their own professional duties. That's maybe the, that's maybe it. Um, but the so but what we're trying to what we're really trying to understand and focus on is, you know, what what is the risk that a consumer could be hurt from a service they receive from your your entity. Um, and the problem is that like, because we know very little about how, and this is why having Becky on the team is so important, but we know very little about how, how people engage with legal services at all. I mean, most don't. So that's, it, we're sort of operating in a little bit of a vacuum in that way, which is why the, the structure that we've developed is sort of a proxy structure where we are building in the assumption that where there's heavy lawyer involvement, in the model and in the service provision at the front end, it's a lower risk model, at least at the beginning. Um, and that's sort of like the main uh, axis around which our model turns. Um, we hope, you know, down the line as we collect data, we hope to be able to understand with more finesse what's going on. Um, so anyway, uh, what that means in reality is that we ask, we we ask our applicants to do to interrogate their model thinking about consumer risk so and we as an office have identified three primary harms that we're worried about and it's basically just what's the risk that a consumer will get bad advice inaccurate or inappropriate advice um what's the risk that a consumer will that the, 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 the service fails to spot the issue you know, so the consumers fails to to act on a on a legal right that they have, um, and then what's the risk that the consumer purchases an unnecessary or inappropriate service, which is upselling? Those are the three risks. That's it. And actually, if you look at the rules, the lawyer rules, like they really all are about those three risks essentially. Um, so, so we ask our applicants to to interrogate their model for for these risks and any others that maybe we haven't identified like perhaps you know if if it's a if it's a blockchain model you know talk to us about the risks of of, of a blockchain uh, you know uh service you know what's the risk that what gets interred into the blockchain is wrong or that a hack does something to it you know so um so we ask them to do that and then oh sorry i was just going to object there's a there's a, a key element to this risk assessment that i want to make sure we we talk about it's not how risky is this versus if this person went and got um, a lawyer by the hour to do this very same service? Uh, it's it's how risky is this service for this person relative to what they're otherwise going to receive in the way of legal services, which in many instances would be a DIY type of a solution. So that's that's a critical question here because we, we are not expecting our applicants to you know deliver services necessarily you know as as though they were that by the hour lawyer with no budget. Yeah, exactly. It's the relative risk of harm relative to where the consumer is as we find them. So that's tricky because as we said, we know very little about where most consumers are, but that's what we're trying to do. We don't want to set up an impossible standard at the front end. So yeah, then after, then we, you know, we have a couple other questions that are sort of around disclosures um, and, uh, you know, identifying what it, it what it's interesting one of the most challenging aspects of this um so far has just been getting people to like clearly explain what their service model is like what they're proposing um which i think is is indicative of the fact that this is sort of a brave new world as you said at the beginning i think like that people are have i have there's a you know people are figuring it out um, and so one of the things that we see that we've been doing is trying to focus folks in and say, okay, what's ready to implement now? 
let's focus on that and let's figure out, you know, what that looks like and let's categorize that and all these other ideas you have come back to us when you're ready to implement them. Um, so that's sort of like distilling folks down has been, I think, one aspect of what we've been doing. Um, and that's really it. And once, once we kind of engage in that back and forth um, uh, with them about, about those questions in the application, um, we have a discussion amongst ourselves and figure out, okay, how are we gonna categorize this model? And as John said, we've sort of established our basic categories that may change as we see more, you know, we have, there could be models that come before us that we haven't, that don't fit into any of our categories yet. And then those are, those are, are keyed to certain um, risk levels. And then the risk levels are keyed to, really to data reporting requirements. So low risk, like um, the bankruptcy guy with his paralegal, um, really it's gonna be just, you know, monthly or quarterly consumer complaints, for example. Um, and then it'll go up from there. And, and the more robust data requirements are focused on these non-lawyer providers, whether they are software or people. Um, and those we really, we ask for outcome data, financial outcome and non-financial outcome. We ask for audits um, upfront. And then if it's very high risk, continuing audits. Um, we ask for uh, samples of comparisons. So of, of like purchases of services and what services are actually provided so we can watch for upselling. Um, there's several more, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I've looked at the, the chart so many times I've forgotten, but um, yeah. So, so, and then that's what we recommend to the court. And then the court it's, you know, all of this is at the discretion of the court. They, they make their own completely new evaluation um, and then they decide what they want to do. Super useful overview. And um, I, I think one of the observations uh, you and, and John made around this too, I, I think really a crucial one is when you're looking at the, the risk assessment, this is not against some hypothetical ideal representation scenario that we're measuring that risk against. We're looking at the, uh, for example, the World Justice Project data point of, I think 77% of consumer legal issues going unaddressed by a lawyer that most people are going without representation. This is the bar that we should be measuring at least some of these services against is what is the risk that there is no representation at, at all for a consumer. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see what we see come out of this, uh, this sandbox. And we're, we're unfortunately running low on time. We could easily chat for another, another hour, but I'd love to uh, circle back with you you both uh, in the future and hear what some of the the data points coming out of this uh, th this exciting experiment look like and uh, congratulations again to uh, to both of you for for what you've uh, what you and your your teams have built out here it's truly exciting and keen to see what uh, what happens here and uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask for a concluding thought from from both of you as a, a takeaway from from this episode you want to share with our our listeners and, and Lucy, maybe you could start. Well, I was going to say, I was thinking as you're talking, uh, Clio data has been very uh, relevant to all of this um, because Clio data about the efficiency of lawyers um, and, and the uh, difficulty that, that many lawyers face in making ends meet. Um, and you know, that, that's huge gap between hours worked and hours collected. Right. Um, that you all have highlighted in your data, um, that has proven to be a really powerful point for us to make um, to lawyers who are who th who see end days and what's being proposed, and 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 we're able to say to them, no, we're talking about opportunity here, like opportunity for you to do the work that you love in a way that actually is more efficient right. and more secure, um, whether that's as a staff attorney in a, in a in a company. Um, or what, ha or partnering with a, with an accountant or, or I don't know, a medical professional. So I think that I just wanted to make that point because the, the Clio data is really valuable to the market in a lot of ways and, and specifically to this project. So thank you. Um, and other than that, I'll just say like, this has been such a fun ride and I'm, it's hard, it's real hard, it's emotional, but I'm so excited and I'm so honored to be working with folks like John and Dino and Becky and Tom and Jillian and everyone in Utah who is just brilliant. So um, thanks. 
Yeah, it's definitely nice and great to have a, a great team. And I, I, I second everything Lucy said about how fun it's been so far. I do feel like, you know, a little bit like the world's watching us right now. And, and you know, you know, the ball, we're, we're, all, we're holding the ball. So we got to be sure <laughs> right. that we don't, we don't, uh, we don't plug it up somehow. And, and uh, that to me is, 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 is a big, a big question right now. Um, I, I feel we, I feel we're ready, but I think there, like I say, I, I hope there will be an example set that others could follow. And, and I would just, the other, I was going to talk about this from the standpoint of, of lawyers as well. I, I have a son that's, you know, 30 years old and he's a, he's a, you know, a young lawyer. I, I don't see this as the end of lawyers. I see this as a reimagining of the lawyer business in ways that will ultimately make it better to be a lawyer. You know, will you make more money? I, I don't know that answer, but will you have less hassle in your practice? I, I hope you will. Will you be able to do what you really wanted to do as a lawyer, which is really help people analyze the heart of their legal problems and do that with a leveraged sort of a structure where you can help even more because of the, the structure that you're in. I, I think those are the kinds of, of opportunities that creates for lawyers. And, and, and in the end, that is so important. I don't really like having jokes about lawyers be the most important thing most people know about lawyers, but we've built ourselves into that position, right. you know? And, and, I, and I, this is certainly not a panacea but I'd like to think about this as a step, you know, away from that impression on our, the public that we serve and towards the idea that this is actually useful to me to have legal services. So. Well, I, I share your, both of your optimism that there, this is not a zero sum game, that there's an enormous opportunity here. And I think the kind of reforms that you're putting in place that allow lawyers to be more entrepreneurial and better create product market fit between themselves and the enormous need that exists in the market is is only a good thing. So uh, keep up the great work. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to checking in with you and, and seeing how things are going. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider for supporting this podcast. 